You know, one of the things right? that strikes me about our, our current system is that with interest rates being as low as they are there is no incentive to save and people are like yes. well that's fine the smart thing to do is to put your money in the stock market but i feel like you have a gun to your head on on putting the money in the stock market because what else are you going to do unless that, you have a big enough pile to buy land or something that you can make productive there's nowhere else to go it, it's that or real estate because when you can borrow money so cheap you can get real estate cheap Right. That's why you have that's why we had the the last bubble. The last bubble was a real estate bubble. Right. There's so many problems here. I, I'm, I'm gonna go down a, a couple of roads if you don't mind. The first one is the interest rates being so low. I'm old enough to remember walking into a bank as a teenager with my one of my first paychecks and looking and seeing I can get a, a CD, a certificate of deposit for two years, and I could get 10% on it. That's unheard. That's like magic now. If I told someone that now, they'd say, "What planet are you on?" But that's that was a real thing when I was a teenager coming in with my my paycheck. I could put it into a CD and I can get ten percent. My parents' mortgage in their house was thirteen percent. That was the mortgage rate. Yes, because that's how things used to be back when back before the ending of Glass Steagall. Right, Glass Eagle was was the end. That was actually the end of it. Right, once that happened, the ball game was over. Let's and talk reason- about Glass Eagle because that's a term that gets thrown around all yep. the time. I remember when I was living in Washington D.C., people would stand with signs um, yep. either for or against Glass Eagle. What is that? Yes, that that was the end of our of our finances. That was that was the end. At that point, now we are doomed to. to once that happened, we as a nation are are doomed to either bankruptcy, default, or just turning out our money into a cryptocurrency or something like that. That was the end. And what happened was, it, if you go prior to uh, Glass-Steagall, a bank could be one of two things, either a savings and loan or an investment bank, one of the two. That was wonderful. All this other deregulation and regulations weren't that important. The critical aspect is when you had life insurance, a mortgage, your savings account, it was in a savings and loan. That's what it was in. You couldn't gamble with that money. That was against the law unless you chose to. Then you would say, hey, I want to roll a dice with my money. Let me go to an investment bank, throw it in the market. Let's do it, right? You can do it if you wanted to. No worries. Your option, your choice. I'm a good libertarian. I'm happy about you doing what you want with your money when you when you see fit. But right after glass Eagle went away, it was okay to put your mortgages in the market. It was okay to put your life insurance in the market. In fact, why would a retail banker care about your, your, your money in, in your bank account when he makes way more money if he throws it into the, uh, if he throws it into the market and starts p- making transaction trading fees? Of course he does. You look at retail banking prior to that. Again, when I was a kid, they would give you a gift to open up an account. Like I got like a, I think I got an electric can opener. I think I remember that. I got an electric can opener. I gave to my mom. I was like sixteen, and I and I gave an electric can opener to my mom because I got it at the bank. The bank gave me an electric can opener for opening up an account. Now try to open up an account in a, in a bank now. If they can't sell you life insurance, open up three more accounts. If they can't get those transaction fees, they're mad at you. You don't get any service now, retail banking, unless you have at least two million dollars in assets, at least. 10 million is even more that now they might pick up the phone. Maybe, probably not, but they might pick up the phone at 10 million, right? That's how that begins to work. Retail banking was destroyed at that point. But more importantly, America didn't know it. America had no idea. Look, I, I'm a bit radical in this, but I believe it. The stock market's a casino. That's what it is. It should not be regulated by the SEC. The SEC is the Praetorian guard of the bankers. It, it supports them and no one else. The SEC is an embarrassment. It's a joke. It should be shut down tomorrow. It's horrible. It should it should be run by a gaming commission. I'm not joking when I say that. Hey, gaming you, commissions gonna... are fairer and better, and at least you have to put the odds uh, of what you're doing to the person who's putting their money in. Yeah, I I used to get in this argument with uh, my brother quite often, and I was working for a large corporation, Monsanto, right? And mm-hmm. so this is the largest seed herbicide company in the world. Yep. And uh, I would go talk with the investor relations people. They're good people. They're smart people. They're hardworking. But there is no possible way to value a corporation at the size and the shape that these companies are and do that with 
hundreds or thousands of companies and all these reports that they're writing they mean nothing they're nothing. they might as well be etched on in sand or something Correct. like that and we're living in a world where the the quarterly reports and the numbers and whether mean or nothing. not they hit that they mean not and you nothing. can do anything you yep. want to make those numbers work as Absolutely. long as over a period of time you don't get caught with your pants down but Correct. that's it and as long as you can predict the past you're a genius <laughs> tell me more about that Right. Well, what does happen? Something happens in the market. And then what does everyone go on TV? See, the reason why that happened is this thing I've just made up to make myself seem smart. That's what we do. Or the reason why that happened is this thing that will hopefully make you believe this is not a casino and that there's actually something behind this. Stock prices go up and down on only one thing, only one thing, perceived value. That's it. Per desire. Do I want to buy it? That's it. If I don't want to buy it, the stock price goes down. If I want to buy it, the stock price goes up. It could be a, the biggest dog of a company, could be the best company on the planet. It doesn't matter. That's what the stock, the stock market runs. So as I call it a casino, if you know what you're doing in the market, then it's like playing poker, right? Because you have some savviness, some skill. You're playing against others, still gambling, but now it's poker or maybe blackjack. House always wins, but you, maybe it's that. If you don't know what you're doing, it's literally roulette or slots. That's all it is. So all I'm saying is let's let people know that. The average American doesn't know that their mortgage is in the market. Would you put your mortgage in a casino? They all are. Our life insurance, it's in a casino. Would you take your life insurance and go down to Harris and spin the wheel? So let's see what you mean behind the metaphor. When you say your mortgage is in the casino, what does that mean? If the market crashes, your mortgage is going to be screwed somehow. Somehow your dollar is going to become less valuable. Somehow your house is going to become less valuable. Somehow you're going to have to pay extra or less on your mortgage. Something is going to happen to affect you and those around you based upon the market. Not based upon your house, how well you upkeep your house. Not based upon it, what a good owner you are. None of that stuff's going to matter. The housing crash happened in 2008, 2009, and it wasn't because homeowners were bad homeowners. It wasn't because it wasn't because of any of that. It was because they had spent so much time turning over, reselling debt, reselling debt, reselling debt, bending it again, bending again, double down, double down, double down, double down. Eventually, you lose. And when you lose, all the people who put their money in. They get hammered. But the worst part about this situation is, and people don't always know this, there's a thing called burning your books. And what that means is the, the, the heavy hitter financial advisors, for the sake of argument here, I'm just using numbers for the sake of argument. They have 100 people who they have assets with, right? The top 10 are their heavy hitters. Those are excuse me, people who have $10 million and more on their assets. All the rest are what they consider chumps, $2 million and less. They don't care about those people. They have them. They need to, they, they, whatever. Now, all of a sudden, they see the crash coming because they always see the crash coming. To be clear, they always, always, 100% see the crash coming. When they see it coming, they then tell their top 10%. They say, hey, time to get liquid. Stuff's getting bad. Top 10% begins to get liquid, selling assets, whatever the case may be, freeing up funds so that they can now buy stuff. Now the crash hits. They then tell the other 90%, oh, crash is here. Sell your stuff. You're in trouble. Well, who's going to buy your stuff with the top 10%? Right. And you had to Larry, you're making this up. Remember the, the story just from last year when the COVID crash was going to hit our Congress, our congressmen and senators here in, in, in America. What were they doing? Selling off their stock and Google that that actually happened, happens all the time. Well, and people don't realize that one of the incentives you have for being a senator is that you do you do not have to follow insider trading rules. So if you find out something in a hearing and you yep. decide to go trade on it, there's nothing wrong with that. Now, if you're an executive and you find out about your competitor doing something, but it's secret information and you go trade on that, you'll be like Martha Stewart clapped in uh, handcuffs yep. and sent to jail. Absolutely. So the elites get what they want and the others don't. That's how that works. Then you might say, well, Larry, are you are you saying that's why there's a massive wealth gap? That is a major reason for a the wealth gap. Not the only reason, but it's a major reason. After every crash, you see a massive wealth gap. It's not because Democrats are bad or Republicans are bad. That's not the reason. It's the reason that when the crash hits, the middle class and the working poor have to sell assets to survive. Who buys the assets? It's the wealthy. Usually through things like private equity firms, hedge funds. Those are the vehicles they use to purchase all the assets. In real estate, they purchase everything. Cars, loans, they purchase everything. They purchase debt. 
they purchase all these things using these vehicles to, so that you can't know, you don't know it's, oh, it's that guy, you know, doing it. They do it through other vehicles and they buy up all the stuff. And now they have it again. And now when the economy comes back, you, you used to be a guy who owned a diner. Now you're the guy who manages the McDonald's and that McDonald's is now uh, is owned by a holding company. <laughs> Thanks for checking out this podcast short. If you like this interview, make sure you hit the like and subscribe button and hit that bell so you always get notified about this podcast. And if you're really interested in conversations like this, you may want to consider joining the Articulate Ventures Network. To find out more, go to network.articulate.ventures.